Good afternoon, buon pomeriggio a tutti. My name is Corrado Paina and I'm the Executive Director of ICO Canada. Welcome to the first edition of Italy, a place to go. This project was developed by the Italian Chamber of Commerce of Ontario, Canada, and is supported by the Embassy of Italy to Canada, the Consulate General of Italy in Toronto, the Italian Trade Agency, the Istituto Italiano di Cultura, and the Italian National Tourist Board. Italy, a place to go, was created to spread knowledge about what lies beyond the widely known Italian charms and attraction, to show us that all Italy is both a place of eternal beauty and sustainable opportunity for the future. I guess we have all been to, to Italy, and if you have not, you will have a chance to get ready for the big trip. The Grand Tour was called time ago. I just want to say that the intent of these five lessons is to present an Italy that is different from the stereotype. We're talking about an Italy that lies on excellence, an Italy that is strong from the industry to the food, to the gastronomy. Every sector in Italy has quite an importance. From aerospace to innovation, we have a country that is working very hard to stay ahead of the uh, needs of today's society. This event also will highlight new and unexpected elements in the fields of economy, design and architecture, innovation and technology, and tourism and culture. Several international known Italian speakers with diverse cultural and professional backgrounds will deliver inspiring lectures and shine a light on Italy's unexpected excellence. Today, we have the pleasure of having with us two experts on the Italian economic system. Francesco Daveri, director of the full-time MBA SDA, professor of practice Bocconi University. Domenico Mauriello, Asso Camere Estero, secretary general. Their presentation will focus on how Italy is actually better than you think and economic growth prospects. But before starting this lecture, here is a video message from the Consul General of Italy in Toronto, Eugenio Sgro, who strongly supports these lectures. As Consul General of Italy in Toronto, I'm glad to support Italy A Place to Go project, initiative conceived and implemented by the Italian Chamber of Commerce in Ontario, in order to promote a few features of Italy. And I would like to share with you some very interesting information about Italy. Italy is a leader in Europe in the circular economy. Italy is the world's leading super yacht manufacturer. The largest solar panels ever built for an interplanetary mission are Italian. Italy is the first country in the world for the number of sites included in the UNESCO World Heritage List, 55 sites. 20 Italians have won a Nobel Prize. Italy ranks first in Europe for the number of cultural initiatives. Italy is the European leader in the design sector with the largest number of companies on the continent. In the last 10 years, Italy is the European country that has seen the most growth in exporting pharmaceutical, 168%, more than double the continental average, plus 68%. 700 years after the death of Dante Alighieri, il sommo poeta, the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs International Cooperation and its networks of consulate, embassies, Italian Institute of Culture all around the world will be organizing more than 500 initiatives in order to celebrate his Somo Poeta, the great poet. Italy is the first country in Europe for the number of small and medium manufacturing industries. These are some of our features which help define Italy, a country which has always stood up united after very challenging, difficult years. And once again, 
we are ready to start from the future. Thank you. Consul General, thank you very much. And now, let me give the floor to Eleonora Andretta, our moderator for these lectures. Eleonora is an interpreter, translator, and instructor of English for Academies purposes at George Brown College in Toronto. Thank you, Corrado. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to moderate this extraordinary initiative supported by Sistema Italia. This event would not be possible without the support from our sponsor, in particular, Util Group and Villa Charities. And talking about our sponsors, just a few words about Util Group. Um, it's a multinational company with more than 800 employees in three plants, supplying fine blanked and conventionally blanked metal parts, primarily for the brake industry. The company is the global number one manufacturer of backing plates and brake shoes used in vehicle brake systems. Here is a short video from Util Group. The theme today is the Italian economic system, and we have the pleasure of hosting a lecture by Francesco Daveri. Francesco Daveri is a professor of macroeconomics and the director of the full-time MBA at Bocconi University's School of Management in Milan. He has taught in several Italian and European universities, and he has acted as a consultant for the Italian Ministry of Economy, the World Bank, the European Commission, and the European Parliament. He was also a member of the Sustainability Committee of Horizon Capital for a few years. Francesco Daveri is here with us today to deliver a lecture entitled Empowering Lives Through Knowledge and Imagination, Italy's Macro Scenarios Better Than You Think. Enjoy the lecture. So hello, um, my name is Francesco Daveri uh, and I'm, I'm glad to, to share uh, uh, these moments uh, uh, with you. Uh, the uh, title of my presentation is Italy's Macro Scenarios, uh, and it says it all better than you think. Italy's Macro Scenarios are better than you think, and that's the topic that I want to deal with with you uh, today. Uh, this is an important topic, uh, and it's in a, just because Italy is uh, uh, a country that is often uh in the uh, in in the spotlights uh, but at times uh, i think that this is for the wrong reason so i think it makes sense uh, uh for for today uh, to consider whether this makes sense or not and so therefore the first thing to to mention is that uh, in spite uh, of uh, some of the discussions that we hear about uh, the uh, uh, plausibility of the Italian uh, uh, economic scenarios and so on, it remains that Italy is still Italy after all. We have uh, that, uh, as you see in the picture, we have uh, La Scala, uh, we have uh, uh, La Ferrari, we have uh, Giorgio Armani, uh, and we have Italy, uh, not uh, the the name of the country, but then the fact that, uh, that we can also have uh, that the uh, uh, food uh, it can be eaten. And so therefore it's certainly part uh, of, uh, of what we have uh, when, we, when we think of Italy. And this is also related to, uh, in particular, to the symbol uh, of uh, Oscar Farinetti's uh, uh, work, uh, which is part of the story. So the bottom line here, however, is that uh, 
uh, in spite of uh, all the things that we may uh, that you may have heard about Italy, uh, it remains that Italy is still Italy for the reasons uh, that I'm uh, some of, some some of the reasons that I'm uh, uh, being picturing here. Uh, moreover, Italy is not just Italy. Italy is also Milano. And Milano is uh, a European capital that blends uh, history and uh, modernity. Uh, and this is, I think, uh, uh, nicely pictured uh, uh, in this uh, 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 scenario here, where we have uh, uh, juxtaposed uh, the, uh, some of the statues uh, that, that are uh, uh, coming from, uh, from the Duomo di Milano, uh, but at the same time, uh, we also see from this picture that uh, Italy uh, and Milano in particular is also uh, a European capital that goes, uh, uh, that considers uh, uh, modernity uh, an important uh, element uh, uh, of, the, of the story. And so therefore we have a powerfully pictured here the fact that uh, Italy is uh, uh, almost unavoidably linked between the past and the, and the present and the future. So therefore we have uh, uh, statues uh, and ancient uh, uh, examples of what has been, uh, but we also have uh, that uh, there are uh, uh, modern uh, capitals uh, that, is, that are uh, uh, reported here. Uh, so, once we have seen uh, these two pictures here, the question is uh, whether we can really reconcile uh, such diverse uh, uh, data and views. Uh, uh, and the answer that I would suggest is, uh, uh, as somebody else uh, uh, more famous than I am, uh, he used to say, yes, we can. We can reconcile diverse uh, data and views. Uh, and the first thing here from which I would start, uh, being an economist, I tend to uh, start from, from the economy. And so therefore here we have that Italy uh, has gone through in the last 15 years or so uh, in bumpy times. Uh, that's very visible from the data that we are seeing here. Italy has not been alone in this respect because indeed uh, uh, waves have been present, present there. Uh, but then uh, uh, what we have is that, particularly for Italy, the sequencing of uh, three recessions from the crisis that we can call the Lehman crisis uh, uh, of uh, uh, 2008. Then we have the Euro crisis, which was uh, 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 in uh, uh, 12, 2012. And then uh, the most recent one, so the, the, the pandemia, the pandemia uh, uh, crisis, uh, uh, these are all elements that tend to show that Italy has, be, has been uh, going through uh, uh, difficult times uh, and large fluctuations. Uh, the important thing is that uh, we, have, we had the three recessions, so the Lehman-related re recession, the Euro crisis, the pandemia, but together with these uh, three recessions, we also have three recoveries. So this is a sign of resilience, which is, I think, a very important uh, element to consider when one thinks uh, uh, of Italy. Overall, it remains uh, that the GDP balance, uh, namely what happened uh, after about uh, almost 15 years uh, from the time of Lehman Brothers, uh, is that uh, uh, the, the balance of GDP of Italy is negative for about 10%. So therefore, uh, we started uh, uh, in 2008 with a 10% uh, GDP, uh, with a level of GDP which was higher than what we see today. Uh, speaking of this, uh, the, the, the lack of, of recovery uh, for, uh, uh, of, of Italy uh, uh, may be seen as importantly related to one specific aspect, and this specific aspect uh, has to do with the fact that Italy's housing prices uh, 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 is an important missing element uh, of the uh, lack of recovery that we see with this data, that the comparison between uh, 
Italy and, uh, uh, and, and Europe uh, in general is striking in this respect. If you compare the Euro area uh, data with, uh, with Italy's data, you would see that there's a scissors there. Uh, we have seen uh, that the uh, European housing price index uh, uh, has been uh, going well uh, uh, after the uh, end uh, of, the, uh, of the situation in which the euro crisis has been around. There was a, a recovery since then, but then start, starting sometimes in uh, 2016, we have that the, uh, there's a striking comparison between something that is there and something that is not there. Something that is there is the recovery that the Italian, that the European uh, area has shown in terms uh, of the price index. Uh, at the same time, there is also uh, something that is not there. And the, the, the something that is not there is the lack of recovery. If we look at the, at the data, therefore, for housing prices, we do see that there is uh, uh, something missing there in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, the lack of something that instead uh, we would like to see there. And in fact, uh, it's not there yet. Still, having said this, which uh, also points to some difficulties uh, and some difficult contingencies that the Italian economy uh, is still uh, uh, going through, then there is still something that we have to consider here. Uh, I, uh, I apologize, uh, but that there is uh, some uh, um, words, some Italian words reported here. Uh, but I will be tra translating for you what, what we are seeing here is that the, during the pre-COVID uh, recovery, the turnover of Italian companies of uh, any size, so any is the most important uh, uh, word that I wanted to mention here, has performed well, irrespective of whether they were grandi, namely uh, with large size, uh, medie or piccole, uh, then the important thing is that if we look at the data and the change compared to the previous year of uh, turnover, fatturato is turnover. So therefore what we have is that the turnover has been typically going particularly better uh, 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 with respect to the past. The data that are reporting here, they go back to 2017. So what you see is that the 2017 has been an year in which uh, all uh, uh, Italian uh, 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 companies uh, have uh, done well, uh, irrespective of whether you're speaking of small companies or large companies. At times we hear speaking about uh, how difficult it is for a small, for a small economy and for, uh, for small sized companies is to perform well. Well, this is not really true because in fact it seems that uh, even for small firms it's possible to to do well and the same can be uh, seen for uh, uh, for small sized uh, uh, enterprises uh, once again one of the stories uh, of the story that has often uh, mentioned is that uh, italian uh, uh, small and medium enterprises would be uh, not faring particularly well because they are small. Well, it remains that in fact the international exposure uh, makes uh, makes an important difference, and so therefore uh, the the balance uh, sheets uh, results uh, that can be seen uh, for uh, uh, can for for uh, um, companies. Uh, with particularly pronounced inter international exposure, tend to show uh, very good data when we look uh, at uh, uh, the balance sheets uh, of, uh, um, uh, of, in, of, uh, of Italian companies. So higher cash flows, lower borrowing costs uh, as a share of debt, higher return on equity. These are technical or less technical, uh, depending on tastes. Uh, these data here tend to show that the Italian economy is faring well or very well, particularly if uh, the Italian economies we are speaking about are those that are particularly uh, exposed to uh, international, to an international setting and to international uh, exchanges. So to conclude, uh, uh, perhaps uh, one thing that I would mention is that uh, Italy has uh, certainly many problems, it's still there from a long time, uh, but in fact, uh, we have that by and large, uh, Italy's aggregate growth uh, still hovers around around the 1%. So therefore, in aggregate terms, uh, 
we do see that uh, we, we cannot be said, it cannot be said that Italy's performance uh, is the performance of a tiger. Uh, what we are having is that the average uh, ability uh, of Italy to grow is still uh, rather limited. But then what we have, and that's important thing to mention here, is that there's plenty of companies with double digit growth uh, which are flourishing and they just started flourish. Uh, in this respect. So that's, uh, this is important. And the other important thing is that, yes, we all, well, very often we hear about uh, the fact that the Italian uh, public debt is very high, uh, but then uh, that's true. But at the same time, uh, Italian public finance data are not very much influenced uh, by inherent uh, political instability that you may have heard about. The important thing to mention here is that Italy uh, is very unlikely or uh, is just unlikely to fail uh, uh, in, in spite of the fact that, that uh, we often hear about these things. But the important thing here to remember is that uh, uh, Italy has always repaid uh, its debt. And so therefore, I don't frankly see uh, any reason to change uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this trend. Uh, we, we have that public debt has gone up. Uh, and even private debt, but at the same time, this debt is sustainable. Interest rates are very low and they will continue to be low. So therefore there's no reason to be worried about the future of Italy. So that's why uh, I tend to think that foreign investors with an ability to select, uh, which is an important thing. So it's not that you can simply uh, put money around uh, without worrying about uh, whether you are spell, uh, spending well or not well uh, your, uh, uh, your money. Well, in Italy, they will continue to find a very good investment and I would add life opportunities uh, in our country. So therefore I consider this a very important element for, uh, uh, for investors, uh, uh, irrespective of we speak uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, in, uh, investment opportunities, but at the same time also life opportunities and life, remember, counts a lot. Thank you so much for this presentation, Francesco. It was not only interesting, it was also refreshing. First of all, it's refreshing to hear from an expert. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for giving clear information about the economy and giving us like a, a real perspective. What you said um, towards the end of your presentation really impressed me because I think it's, it's worth reflecting on that. You said that the um, Italian political instability does not actually affect uh, investments. And we actually have a couple of questions now from the audience. And one of them um, actually is, does it make sense to invest and live in Italy in 2021? So you touched briefly on that, but uh, can you please expand? Well, I have a, a clear answer on this. Uh, if you invest in countries and uh, in which uh, uh, opportunities have been exploited entirely then it's difficult to make money out of this. So therefore, I think that taking a little bit of risk uh, uh, makes sense in case you want to make uh, 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 money that is uh, 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 comparable or uh, uh, better than what we have seen uh, in the past. And certainly on the one hand, we have that Italy tends to appear at times uh, uh, for, uh, for the wrong reasons uh, in uh, uh, what we have seen before. Uh, but at the same time, we also have that somehow uh, uh, foreign investors that, are, uh, uh, that, that look at the data and consider that they would be, uh, when coming to Italy and deciding whether they want to take, uh, uh, to invest their money in, uh, in Italy and in uh, some Italian companies, then uh, uh, we will really see uh, that foreign investors uh, with an ability to select uh, may actually be uh, performing uh, much better than uh, uh, countries uh, and than in countries uh, and in uh, uh, companies where uh, uh, opportunities to invest and to make money uh, appears more obvious somehow. Uh, but if you go to obvious uh, uh, investment choices, uh, then uh, uh, the, uh, the opportunity to make money and to make uh, profits uh, is actually potentially lower. Instead, uh, uh, if carefully considering uh, uh, 
uh, where to put uh, uh, money in a country like Italy, which has been uh, uh, subject to some uh, difficult contingencies at times. Uh, at the same time, uh, we would be in the position, uh, uh, we are now in a, in a position in which uh, interest rates are very low, uh, they are going to remain low, we have a high public debt, but if public debt and, uh, uh, and even private debt uh, remains low, then there's really no reason to, to worry. Uh, that, that's at least my point uh, about, uh, about Italy. And so therefore, uh, there might be uh, opportunities to make money that you cannot make uh, in other countries uh, where uh, 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 perhaps uh, the level of debt uh, is today lower uh, or uh, uh, something like this. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. I think it was really an important point in your presentation. Thank you for that. Um, as you know, one of the themes of these lectures is sustainability. And so I have another question from the audience, which is about sustainability. Um, are we moving towards a more sustainable future, do you think? Uh, one thing is uh, that uh, we must go towards a world uh, which becomes more sustainable. Uh, simply, we cannot afford uh, uh, having something different because we don't have uh, uh, an unsustainable world uh, where uh, we can uh, peacefully live. Uh, so therefore, uh, uh, that's an important uh, element to consider. It has been somehow uh, underemphasized uh, so far, and this has been uh, a mistake. Uh, but for now, instead, what we are doing is that we are moving towards uh, a world which has to become necessarily more, more sustainable, uh, not just uh, uh, financially, uh, not, but also in terms uh, of uh, the ability of sustaining uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the accumulation of natural resources. Uh, and the accumulation of resources more generally. So the, the element that should be uh, uh, crucial for, for us when we wake up in the morning somehow is uh, to do a little bit in order to make the world uh, uh, more sustainable than, than it is, uh, than it, it, it was before we wake up. Uh, so therefore, that, that's a, an element uh, to consider. On the other hand, we also have that the uh, uh, availability of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, companies uh, with, uh, with an interest in uh, sustainability uh, is actually making, uh, uh, making sense in an increasing way uh, as time goes by, uh, because the cost of uh, not taking care of sustainability, then uh, this will become more apparent uh, over time. So therefore, that's another reason for why uh, uh, sustainability should become uh, uh, quintessential of uh, uh, doing uh, uh, or going towards uh, a, a, a more uh, uh, sustainable and more uh, plentiful uh, 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 world where uh, for now we are still living uh, uh, relatively uh, perhaps well or doing uh, what we are doing uh, uh, with relatively low interest rates, a uh, world with doesn't need seemingly to be fixed uh, from one day to another. But then at the same time, there are uh, some uh, uh, inconsistencies in the way in which uh, we spend, in the way in which we consume. These things have to be considered more carefully in order to understand uh, how to achieve uh, uh, sustainability in a more uh, uh, um, uh, consistent way. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense. So we all need to do our part. That was an important message, I think, that you just told us. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for being with us today. So all the best to you and uh, hope to see you in Toronto very soon. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Domenico Mauriello. Domenico is the new Secretary General of Asso Camerestro, the Association of Italian Chambers of Commerce Abroad. Before taking on this role, Mariello was head of the new projects and globalization sector of the Italian Union of Chambers of Commerce. 
He has an in-depth knowledge on the themes of territorial economic development and specific skills in the preparation and management of research projects and interventions, both from an Italian and a European perspective. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Domenico for a lecture on the Italian economic system, focusing on export and sustainability, among other aspects. Enjoy the lecture. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Let me start by thanking, first of all, the Italian Chamber of Commerce of Ontario for their kind invitation and all the participants in this important initiative, Italy, a place to go. During my lecture, I'll try to take some snapshots of some of the strengths of Italy, but not only the well-known Italian excellence in fashion or food, where we already play a leading role. Italy is not only a cultural superpower and home to world-renowned fashion brands and uh, food products, but also a world leader in many important sectors, such as design, pharmaceutical, biomedical products, and aerospace technologies. Uh, Italian strategy, our strategy includes not only trade in high quality products, but nowadays also structured international cooperation through industrial partnerships in strategic sectors and through the transport of technology and know-how as well. Therefore, I'll present some interesting records, often little known or um, underestimated, held by Italy in different fields and above all in sustainable economy, where Italy has managed to achieve results double the European average and much higher than those of all major countries in the world, thanks to a way of producing that is more attentive to quality, to the environment and to human resources. Thanks to such unique combination, Italy is not only competitive on global markets, but also is the eighth biggest world economy and the fourth biggest economy in the world. Italy has the second largest manufacturing base in Europe after Germany, with a strong integration in the EU value chain. But before going into details, let me briefly illustrate the, 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 the role of Italian and uh, Italian, Italian Chevrolet Commerce abroad in the, in the framework of the public system that supports the globalization of Italy. On the left of the screen, you can find the most important public institutions for internationalization from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to the Italian Trade Agency, the different ministries, the other ministries and regions. And on the right, I, I, I want to stress the role of the, the system of Chambers of Commerce, both in Italy, as I said, and abroad, whose main aim is to support through information and training activities all the SMEs that want to start uh, their uh, experience abroad, want to start to be exporters. And this is the main characteristic of our actions and activities uh, during the last five or uh, six years. And this because we have discovered, we have, as a system, have discovered uh, what can be considered as the main weakness of our export. That is the number of exporters, which is less than expected and does not grow. In Italy, we have uh, around 123,000 uh, exporting firms, but th they are almost nothing considering that we have more than 5 billion active firms in Italy. Moreover, these exporting firms are mostly SMEs, 50% uh, of, of the value of Italian export is held by SMEs compared to 20% 
example, France and Germany. And if we consider only uh, enterprises with less than 50 employees, uh, this figure is equal to 20%. So it is true that the average exported value of, of, of Italy is growing, as you can see in red, but the number of exporters is decreasing. Moreover, uh, two other important aspects have to be stressed. First is, apart from the fact that, that we have micro exporters, but the amount of our export is quite limited. Only about 11,000 companies have a turnover of more than 5 million euros abroad. And 45% uh, of our SMEs export less than 10%. So it means that they are simply occasional exporters. And also the concentration of markets is quite high. 47% of our SMEs uh, export only to one market, especially in Europe. This situation, of course, has been uh, has changed due, due to the pandemic and has changed in worse during the pandemic. And that's why uh, our government Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, firstly, have uh, developed the so-called Patto per l'export, the Export Pact, which is a strategic uh, document uh, carried out, especially in order to support our SMEs after pandemic. Uh, and in this document, uh, Chambers of Commerce are identified and specified uh, mainly for their role in supporting uh, very small enterprises in doing, the, 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 in starting their activity uh, on foreign markets. And two main points uh, have been addressed for, for, for Chambers of Commerce. The first is the coordination of operations and timely execution. It means that uh, the government has uh, considered the important the role of Chambers of Commerce in listening and giving an answer to SMEs. And then for the promotion of Italian agricultural and food excellence and contrast with Italian sounding, uh, especially for the so-called project True Italian Taste, uh, which involves uh, 36 chambers of commerce abroad and 23 countries and Ontario is one, the Chamber of Ontario is one of these 36 chambers of commerce. Let's start with the, with the situation after the pandemic. This is the starting point and these are the effects of the pandemic on the export of Made in Italy products in 2020. As you can see, as in many other countries, the, the, the export of our country uh, decreased uh, about 10%, 9.7%. But uh, it is to be said that some sectors recorded a growth, pharmaceutical, food, and agricultural products. And at the same time, Italy uh, in manufacturing industry, uh, the, 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 the Italian market share has been to quite stable uh, between uh, 2019 and 2020. And in some countries, our market share increased, slightly increased as well. That means that in spite of the pandemic and in spite of these performances, there are some long-term trends that has to be stressed. In some sectors especially. And uh, for instance, as you remember, pharmaceutical was the sector uh, that recorded a growth uh, last year and Italy it has to be said that Italy uh, maintains a leading role in Europe for pharmaceutical production 
with uh, 32.9 billion euros uh, just behind Germany and, and followed by France, UK and Spain. And uh, another reason for this is the growth in exports, which between 2009 and uh, 2019 uh, rose by 168%, almost twice the EU average, uh, 86%, and more than other European big players. And that it's something that is expected to, to happen and to, to even to grow in the next future. Then the second sector, which has uh, recorded a growth last year, uh, agri-food sector. Uh, food industry is one of the leading sectors of the Italian economy and also in the year, in the year of the pandemic, uh, Italy uh, reached uh, 46.1 billion euros, the all-time high in agricultural and food product exports. And the, the, the share of total exports reached for the first time uh, more than 10% of total exports. And the Italian food industry offers the highest standards in terms of safety and quality, combining uh, the tradition on the one hand and also innovation and above all sustainability. Italy is in fact the most sustainable country in the agricultural field and the first one in the world for food quality certification, that is for products recognized by the European Union as geographical indication and designation of origin. But apart from uh, pharmaceutical and, and and food, there are other uh, records that people, some people do not know, especially uh, also some uh, scholars and policy makers. First, the strong link between design and made in Italy. Italy ranks second in Europe for turnover to GDP ratio in design sector. And we have the highest number of design companies in Europe, about uh, 15, 16% of the EU total. Italy is leader in yachting, especially luxury yachts, with the world's highest trade balance. And we are second, we have recorded the second highest in exports after the Netherlands. Then we are the we, we are first for experts in wood industry in Europe uh, with almost ten billion dollars. We are third in the world for trade balance in in this uh, in this sector, and we are also first in Europe in circular economy with ninety three percent of chipboard made of recycled. Last but not least, the fashion, the well-known fashion sector of Italy. We are the second in the world in fashion for market share with 6.8%, about 7%. We are only behind China and this is thanks not only to Italian creativity and style, but also to the, also in this case, to the, also in this case, to the environmental commitment of Italian companies. We have more and more records uh, in machineries, in automotives, in, in tourism, of course, in arts and culture. Uh, I want to stress the fact that uh, we are first in Europe for the number of cultural and creative industry, which is, uh, as you have seen in the, in, in the case of design, is often strictly linked to the, the, the productivity and competitiveness of manufacturing sector. And thanks to all these records, Italy is the world's second most competitive country in the manufacturing sector, 
uh, with if we consider the about uh, five thousand uh, products survived in the world trade Italy is the second country in the world for foreign trade balance um, considering that in uh, 922 uh, products out of these uh, 5,000 um, Italy uh, ranks first, second or or third in terms of uh, trade balance. And due to these results, Italy is nowadays fifth among the G20 countries uh, for manufacturing trade surplus, uh, with a trade surplus uh, exceeding uh, $100 billion. We are fifth after China, after South after Germany, after South Korea, after Japan, and above uh, France, UK, and uh, United States. But there are some, some weaknesses in this case as well. Italy does not take advantage, fully takes advantage uh, of all the opportunities offered by digital export. Uh, as you can see, as far as uh, B2C uh, is concerned, um, Italian exports through e-commerce uh, are equal to 12 billion uh, euros, approximately. And this is uh, uh, almost nothing compared to the potential of our manufacturing system. Uh, the, the, the level is really low and that's why we have recorded a, a growth of uh, 15 percent before the pandemic as you can see for instance in the food sector which is one of the uh, sectors where italy is leader at world level only three percent of uh, total export is due to eco so the, the, there are uh, the, there is room for improvement, great room for for improvement due to the fact that our SMEs still feel the lack of digital culture and uh, bureaucracy and legal aspects are still considered as burdens. And this is especially a weakness considering that. Uh, we are in times we are living in times of a growing market of online sales. Uh, there are the, the estimates uh, say that there are uh, 1.5 billion online shoppers, and Italy has to take advantage of these opportunities, considering that, as you can see here, uh, in most uh, countries, Italy is the most Googled country. Uh, it means that consumers in these countries uh, firstly search for uh, Italian goods on the internet. But more, very, very often they cannot find these products uh, online or even in, 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 in physical uh, department stores. But apart from the weaknesses that I told you about, we have to say that uh, along the years Italy has been able to combine tradition and innovation, as I said, uh, through manufacturing processes focused on quality, on human relations, uh, respectful of the environment, and also a sustainable use of resources. And nowadays, green economy gives more competitiveness to Italian companies. A uh, few people know that uh, about one third of Italian companies with at least one employee invest in green economy, have invested in green economy in the last five years. That is to say they have invested in green products and green technologies uh, aimed at reducing the environmental impact, uh, in saving energy, and containing emissions too. And these 
green companies innovate the most, they grow the most in terms of turnover, they uh, generate the most employment, and most of all, they export the most. There is a, a clear difference between green and non-green uh, SMEs uh, in terms of growth in exports. And our country is also second in the world for exports of green products. <clears throat> According to a study uh, carried out by the University of Oxford, Italy ranks second uh, in the world as per the so-called Green Complexity Index uh, behind Germany, as you can see, and followed by USA, Austria, Denmark, and China. And this index measures the ability to export technologically advanced green products. And these results confirm the sustainability efforts of our SMEs and how sustainability represents a strategic asset for the future of made in Italy and for the future of our country. Uh, and Italy can really play a key role uh, in both growth and economic competitiveness in the Green Translation Challenge. Uh, more and more in the future, we hope. Um, and, and now Italy is already first in Europe in terms of circular economy and for the efficient use of resources in manufacturing processes. Um, the, 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 the percentage of waste uh, that are sent for recycling is equal to 79.3%, which is almost twice, twice the average of the European Union, 39.2% there and on, the, on the left of the screen, and stands uh, much higher than the other uh, larger European countries, from Germany to Spain to UK and to France. And Italy also holds a prominent role worldwide in the field of renewable energy as well. So going to the end, uh, if we consider the mega trends that will shape the restart after the pandemic, or at least the three uh, more, most important mega trends, which are digitalization, health and wellness, and sustainability and the environment, uh, according to what I already said, Italy is has the possibility to, 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 to overcome the, 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 the economic crisis due to, due to the pandemic and to become even more important in the global scenario than, than, than in the past. And in considering that the, the, the consider also the evolution of demand in the different macro areas of the world, uh, the growth prospects of Italian manufacturing exports in 2022, next year, is definitely positive. And uh, Italy is supposed to uh, catch the recovery of international demand, especially in far emerging markets. And uh, in sectors like automotive and, of course, uh, food industry. Um, all these data and economic forecasts represent the fundamental drivers supporting Italian economy, and I think they're useful in providing a better understanding of Italy to foreign institutions as well as entrepreneurs and business associations, but therefore they can help us, uh, Italian Chambers of Commerce abroad, uh, identify new fields of cooperation at international level, like we are doing here during this initiative, Italy, a place to go. Uh, thank you and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you very much for this overview, Domenico. It was really interesting.
Um, you mentioned the growth prospects of Italy now that we are talking about restarting the economy. So about this, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, and the first one is, what are your thoughts on the post-pandemic economic situation in Italy? Uh, well, Italian economy is recovering step by step, but is recovering. In this year, in 2021, GDP is expected to increase uh, and followed by an increase also um, next year in 2022. But we have to say that these estimates in, of growth um, are nothing than a, a partial recovery of the decrease that we have recorded last year. And in both years, this year and next year, uh, the domestic demand will provide a remarkable contribution, uh, while on the other hand, foreign demand will provide a slightly contribution. More, and more in detail, I can say that uh, on the one hand, residential household consumption expenditure is expected to increase and especially investments are expected to provide the most remarkable impact on the economy. But exports and imports will grow in both years in line with the recovery of international trade, as I said. Uh, but we have to say that at the micro microeconomic level, uh, our SMEs can take advantage of the opportunities at the international level and of the uh, growth of international demand only if they boost their uh, commitment in sustainability and digitalization. And for this purpose, I, uh, I, it is really important for, for, for Italy, for my country, to get the most out of the so-called uh, National Recovery and Resilience Plan, the NRRP, which contains important measures to support SMEs in this process. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and the second question is, how much do you think tourism can help in the recovery process? Well, uh, uh, tourism um, recorded a, a, a severe decline, uh, both in inbound and outbound flows last year, uh, in terms of number of visitors, in terms of uh, expenditure. Uh, we have to say that that the, the decrease uh, was uh, about 64% as far the consumption expenditure of foreign tourists. And we have to say that, that against this background of a global collapse in international travel, uh, uh, in 2020, Italy's uh, world market share in international tourism uh, slightly increased. And let's not forget that Italy is the second European country for number of overnight stays uh, of non-EU tourists. And 70% of the worldwide uh, historic heritage is in Italy. And this means that sooner or later, but we do hope really, really soon, uh, tourism in Italy is expected uh, to grow again and to uh, give a positive contribution to GDP uh, as it was in the past. Also due to the um, strong selection and the upgrading, modernization and qualification of all our touristic offer. Thank you. Yes, we need to rely on our tourism. Thank you very much for that. And thank you so much for being with us today uh, and for thank your you. insights. Have a great day and thank you very much. Thank you. Before giving the floor to the executive director of ICCO Canada, Corrado Paina, let's watch a video on the event online booklet. You can also find the link to the booklet in the chat.
Thank you, Lenora, and thank you once again to Sistema Italia for their incredible support. I'd like to remind to all of you that this is the 60th anniversary of Eco Canada. Please stay around, become a member, work with us. We'd love to have you in our family. And I would like also to take this opportunity to inform you that the Istituto Italiano di Cultura is offering a variety of Italian language and culture courses, ranging from beginner to advanced levels. Please contact the Istituto to register for this lesson. And now allow me to thank all the people who work incredibly hard behind the scenes, both before and during the event. Thank you, Mary Chirico, Ilaria Venoso, Monica Gammarota, Richard Bressan, Tiziana, Astrid, Marisa. Thank you all. Ci vediamo, but in Italian means we're going to see each other again on the 7th of July with the Innovation and Technology Session.